Welcome to the first of three lectures I'm planning to give, which will give an overview of all of Unit 2, G482. In these lectures, what I'll be attempting to do is to cover all of electricity, then all of waves, and then all of quantum physics in one fell swoop. The idea being that you'll hopefully get to see how things fit together a little bit better than you already do. Because when we're teaching just to small topic by small topic, sometimes it's hard to see how things link together and appreciate that overview. So that's the idea. And as I said, today I'll be starting off with electricity. Next week I'll be intending to do electron weights and then after that quantum physics. Hopefully you'll find them helpful. So let's get started with electricity. And uh, you need to have a knowledge of several components. All these components, cells, resistors, switches, lamps, LDRs, light dependent resistors, that is, and the, the other components there. You'll need to know the symbols for them, and you need to know how these devices work in a circuit. You'll, quite, it's quite common for there to be an exam question about some components in particular, which are the light dependent resistor, the thermistor and the fuse, so often you'd have to give an explanation of what they do. So bear that in mind. Let's start to think about what electricity is. So what is electricity? It's a flow of charged particles, like electrons. That would be the most common application of, or most common example of electricity. Current is the rate of flow of charge. So that's how we define what uh, current is. I is delta Q over delta T, the rate of flow of charge. And the units for current are, are amperes, amps. So one amp is equal to one coulomb per second. That's, the, that's how the units match up. Now, if you plot current against time, Rearrange this equation so that it works with that graph. Then the area under this graph would give you the charge. So if you plot the current flowing against time, then you can determine the charge from that graph. The flow that we're talking about here, the flow of charge, is a net flow. Now, charge is often moving around in objects, but we wouldn't say that there is a current there because there's no net flow. So we are talking about net flow, and I will talk about a little bit more about that in a little while as well. So electrons are not static. Conventional current is defined as being from positive to negative, so I have a cell here with positive terminal here, the long thin side and the short thick side is the negative terminal. And Conventional current is from the positive to the negative. Now, conventional current was defined before it was known that electrons are negatively charged and they're the primary charge carriers in, or they are the charge carriers in metals. So therefore they're the primary charge carriers in electricity. So electrons actually flow from the negative terminal to the positive terminal. So you should appreciate the difference between conventional current and electron flow there. If you have an electrolytic solution, uh, you have not just positive or negative ions, but you have positive and negative ions flowing. A common mistake here is to describe the, the movement of charge as just ions in general, but actually you have positive and negative ions, so that you have both moving at the same time. So in metals, charge carriers are electrons. In electrolytic solutions, you have positive and negative ions. Now, how fast is electricity? If I flick a light switch, I get an instantaneous response to that. So does that mean that electricity is very, very fast? And by electricity here, I'm talking about, does that mean that the flow of charge is very, very fast? Actually, current is slow. Current does not move very fast. 
The instantaneous response to turning on a light switch, so I flip the light switch and almost immediately the light comes on, or at least starts to come on if you have a fluorescent light bulb. And that's actually due to a net drift of charged particles, or the electrons, because we're thinking about metals here. It's a net, the net drift of electrons starts around the whole circuit. So current is actually slow. However, electrons do move very, very fast, but they move randomly. So electrons are moving hundreds of meters per second in metals, even when there's no current flowing. But they're moving randomly, so there's no net movement of electrons in one direction or another. If I had a wire, there's no net movement of the electrons. That, so that's normally, but when I put a potential difference across my wire, then the electrons will start to drift in one direction. They maintain that randomness to their motion. So if you look at the individual electron, they're still moving randomly, but if you look at a large number of them, there is a net drift in one direction. And the electrons will be moving from negative to positive. So we need a potential difference in order to cause the, the current. And I said electrons are moving hundreds of meters per second, but the net drift is millimetres per second. And you can do an experiment where you look at the drift velocity of ions in a solution and the speed of the net, the net speed of the electrons will be comparable with the net speed of that of ions, which is millimetres per second if you actually do that experiment. So the equation, uh, current is related to this drift velocity and this is the equation that shows how they're related. The current is equal to NAVQ. N is the number density, so that tells you how many charge carriers you have per unit volume. A is the cross-sectional area, V is the drift velocity, and Q is the charge of the particles. Now, and of each individual particle, that is. If you're dealing with metals, then that's the elementary charge. 1.6 times 10 to the minus 90 kilowatts. So that's net drift. Electrical energy then, and the whole point of using electricity is it's a convenient way to transfer energy. That's what we want to do with it. It's clean, it's fast, and it's easy to use with very small comp components, which is very useful if you have tiny transistors and tiny LEDs like in computers and smartphones and so on. Now as the charge moves around the circuit it's going to do work. Either the, your, either the charge, as the charge moves around the external circuit it's going to be doing work on other components, transferring electrical energy into other forms and as it moves through the power supply work will be done to the charge and it will be gaining energy other forms will be turned into electrical energy. Voltage is the energy transferred per unit charge. V is W divided by Q, where W is the energy transferred and Q is the charge. The units here, to show how vol what volts relate to other units, one volt is equal to one joule per coulomb. And we've already seen that Q equals I times T, so we can substitute in for the Q, rearrange for W, and then the electrical energy transfer is equal to the current times the time times the voltage. So if, you're, if you have an ammeter and a voltmeter and, a, and a, a stopwatch, you can determine how much energy was transferred in a particular circuit. In the power supply, as I said, work is done on the charge, so you're transferring some other form of energy into electrical energy. If you've, got, if you've got cells, then you're transferring chemical energy into electrical energy. In the external circuits, this is external to the power supply, work is done by the charge as it moves around the circuit, so you have an energy transfer such as electrical to heat. If, it's moving, if the current is moving through a resistor, then the transfer is to heat. If it's moved for a light bulb, it's to heat and light and so on. In 
The power supply, we call this voltage the EMF, that's the electro electromotive force, and here we call the voltage a potential drop. So that's electrical energy transfer. Now, when we come to household energy, the joule is not very convenient. So if we're talking about how much energy a house uses in a day or two or a week, especially over a long period of time, like a quarter, then it's more convenient to use a bigger unit. So the joule is not practical, but the kilowatt hour is. Kilowatt hour, the symbol is K, capital W, H. This is more practical because it's a larger unit of energy. And if that's important, it's a unit of energy, it's not a unit of power, which is a common misconception. The definition is that the kilowatt hour is the energy transferred by a one kilowatt device for when it's been used for one hour. And if you wanted to work out how much, if you wanted the equation, then it would be W is equal to the power in K, KW times the time in hours. So if, you, if I said that a device has a power rating of 200 watts, you need to turn it into kilowatts, so that would be 0.2 kilowatts. And if I said it's used for 90 minutes, you need to turn that into hours, so 1.5. If you want to know how much energy one kilowatt hour is equal to in joules, then one kilowatt hour is equal to the power in watts multiplied by the time in seconds, and that's 3.6 megajoules. If you want to calculate the cost of electricity, which is the whole point of having the kilowatt hour in this context anyway, uh, you take the number of units used, now the number of units is the number of kilowatt hours, so you work out how many kilowatt hours, you know, 3.6 or whatever, and multiply by the cost per unit, which is usually given in pence, and then you work out how much it costs to watch TV for four hours or whatever the context was. So that's how you work out the cost of electricity. And that's household energy, so we're using the kilowatt hour as a more practical unit there. So let's talk about, we've talked about energy, now let's talk about power, which is the rate of energy transfer. Just like in mechanics, which I'm sure you're familiar with power from mechanics, power is the energy transfer per unit time, or the rate of uh, rate which energy is transferred. So the equation is the same. P is equal to W divided by T. But we already know that W is equal to ITV for an electrical circuit. So we can substitute that in for the W, and then we get P is equal to ITV divided by T, T to cancel out, and we've got an equation for power there, which is equal to the current times the voltage. <coughs> now we can then substitute with substitute for current and voltage with V equals IR. So we can get to different variations of the equation. If I didn't know what the voltage was, then I can substitute for V, which is IR. Substitute that in and get I squared R. And P is equal to V squared over R as well. So we've got three equations there that we can use. This is relevant for fuses. Fuses have carefully designed wires which will melt if there's too much heat dissipated across it. And that prevents too much current flowing through a component, a device. You know, like it might be your microwave, toaster, TV, something like that. The fuse will uh, melt and that prevents current flowing through, too much current flowing through the device and breaking it. Now, fuses are made in certain categories like 3 amps, 5 amps, 13 amps. So if the device requires a current of 10 amps, you put a 13 amp fuse in it. So you need to go one, you need to go a bit higher than the normal current. Because uh, let's say you had a device which drew three amps of current, and you put a three amp fuse in there. That means just under normal usage, it's going to be drawing three amps, and the fuse is going to keep blowing. So you're not going to be able to use use the device at all and um, so what you do there is put in the 5 amp fuse and that enables you to keep using the device 
and then if it gets too much current, like goes up to five amps, then it will blow and protect the device. Right, um, so we've looked at energy, power, now we're on to resistance, and we, we're building on the work of George Ohm here. So Ohm came up with this law, or he found this law. The potential difference across a conductor is directly proportional to the current flowing through it if the temperature remains constant. So you just need to know Ohm's law. Resistance is the opposition to the flow of charge that's present within materials. And it's defined as the ratio of the potential difference across a component to the current flowing through it. So it's a ratio of it's V divided by I. So that's resistance. Now, that's not to say that if voltage increases, the resistance will increase. And it's not to say that if the current changes, the resistance will change. That's not what that means. So R does not depend upon V or I. Okay? If you have a 100 ohm resistor and you keep the temperature constant for that resistor, then its resistance will stay at 100 ohms, and you can change the voltage across it, and what will change will be the current, not the resistance. And what I'm saying here is that the, the current flowing through it, the voltage across it, does not directly affect the resistance. Indirectly it may, because current, as we'll see, and as we've just been discuss discussing, current can heat things up, because there's a transfer of electrical to heat. So, indirectly you may get an, an effect on the resistance, but directly not. Okay, so R does not depend on V or I. What factors are there for resistance then? Now, resistance arises due to positive ions in, if we're thinking about metals here, so the positive ions in metals, they're in a lattice structure and they obstruct the flow of electrons across the conductor when we put a voltage across it. If there are impurities in the metal, which there most likely will be, those positive ions can distort the crystal lattice and impede the electron flow. So impurities are a resistance, a factor of resistance. More impurities, higher resistance. Temperature is, the, the, out of these two, this is the one you definitely need to make sure you know about. Temperature affects resistance. <clears throat> now, ions in this crystal structure, they are not static. They are dynamic, they are constantly moving. And when we say crystal lattice, we're talking about there's a crystal lattice structure of the, which is based upon the equilibrium positions of the positive ions. Now the positive ions are not moving from here to here, but they are vibrating around this equilibrium position. So that metal, if you were able to look at the, at the atomic level, there's a lot of motion going on there, there's a lot going on. So these vibrations, they can also, uh, imp well they, because the ion is moving around, they can the, impede the electron flow. Now if those vibrations were to get larger, larger amplitudes, then they're more likely to impede electron flow. So that you get an increase in collisions per unit time. Whenever you talk about the numbers of collisions, Happening. If you just talk about a, an absolute value, then you know how long a period did that occur in. You always need to make sure that you you are saying that it's per unit time. So when metals heat up, when the temperature increases, the vibrations of the ions increase in amplitude and speed, and therefore they impede. Elect there are more collisions per unit time or the rate of collisions increases. So let's have a look at the graph. This is a graph of resistance against the temperature. Now note that I'm saying this is in degrees C, so this is zero degrees C. Common mistake here is to have the resistance graph going through zero. That's a mistake, it's not zero. Why should it necessarily be zero at zero degrees C? 
In fact, the graph can continue down as we go towards absolute zero. Even there, it may not be zero. It'll be very, very small, but not necessarily zero. So that's what superconducting is all about. Call your conductor right down, and the resistance will be as small as possible, so you can get large currents flowing. But anyway, resistance is related to temperature in a graph like this, so you should appreciate that graph. Um, we're here we're talking about metals, so as metals, as the temperature of metals increases, the resistance increases. Other materials like semiconductor materials, some of those, their resistance will not increase, it may decrease, and you can use that in devices like thermistors. And uh, also, some semiconductor materials, their resistance will increase, but it'll increase differently. It won't be a straight line like this. So uh, there are different possibilities with different materials. That graph was for metals. Now this is a video showing what, showing the heating effect of current. In the video, there's a metal bar and a large current is passed through it, and you'll see that, that it gets very, very hot. So there's the metal bar. The current is going to flow through this portion here. You might just be able to make out um, the current, extremely large current there, and you'll see it getting hot. You'll also see that as it's heating up, its resistance is increasing, which is causing the current to decrease. So the current is now falling. It went up to about 600 there. It's falling back down towards 400 now. You can see the metal starting to glow. So this large current is causing that metal to glow white hot. Got about 400 amps flowing through it now. So. This is the heating effect of current. Current, the, the power is being dissipated across that metal as heat. The electrical energy there is. Current voltage graphs, you'll need to know some current voltage graphs for different components. There are four components that you'll need to know them for. First up, we have the metal, a metal wire at constant temperature. And here we get a straight line through the origin, because current, is proportion, current through is proportional to the voltage across. So, and it's got constant resistance take the ratio at any point on that line, we'll go back to that one. If you take the ratio at any point along that line, V over I, then uh, you'll, get con you'll get the same value, so the resistance is constant. This is for a filament lamp. Now here, as current flows, the filament heats up and it heats up so much that it starts to glow, and that's how we get light out of it. And so the temperature is increasing, and that increases the resistance. So for similar increases in uh, the voltage there, we're getting less, in, less increasing current. That's a filament lamp. So basically it's a metal with, without constant temperature. This is an LED, light emitting diode. So here, the current is almost zero. And then it reaches a certain threshold, about one volt, and the current, almost all of the current starts to go through. So we've got threshold voltage, about one volt. Less than one volt, the work due to the materials used in the LED, the resistance tends to infinity. So extremely high resistance, basically doesn't let any current flow. Greater than the threshold voltage, and resistance is approximately zero, so it allows all of the current to flow through. So that's our LED, and that applies to an ordinary diode also. Um, we call this region reverse bias, and this is forward bias. So the, the purpose of the diode is to allow current to only flow in one direction. <coughs> so 
automatically when you have a positive voltage. And then we have an NTC thermistor, that's a negative temperature coefficient thermistor. As the current flows here, it's causing the temperature of the thermistor to increase, but instead of the resistance increasing, the resistance decreases here. So that's what's happening with our NTC thermistor. You can have PTC thermistors as well, which are positive temperature coefficient th uh, thermistors, and they will have an, a current voltage profile that suits a particular purpose. So it won't be just like the filament lamp, it will be different because you want to use it for a specific purpose. Kirchhoff's laws. There are two laws that you need to know about, and each one is based upon the conservation of a physical quantity, and you'll need to appreciate which quantity is conserved. There's a common mistake for each one, so hopefully you won't make those mistakes. The first law is based upon the conservation of charge. The mistake is to say that it's based on the conservation of current. It's the conservation of charge which this law is based on. The law is that the sum of currents flowing into a junction is equal to the sum of the currents that flow out of the junction. Here's a circuit. We've got a resistor here. We've got some lamps in various arrangements. Through this resistor, we have a current I1. Now here, the current is going to split, so we've got I2 and I3. Here, I2 will also split, in, and we'll have I4 and I5. So using Kirchhoff's law, first law, we can say that I1 is equal to the sum of those two, because only I1 is flowing into the junction, and I2 and I3 are flowing out. We can then also say, from this junction, I2 is flowing in, so I2 is the sum of the current flowing in, is equal to I4 and I5 summed. And then here we can see that I1 is equal to I4 plus I5 plus I3. So this I1 is flowing in here, so it must be flowing out there. And therefore, we know this is I1 and those three flow into it. Okay. Second law. Uh, this says this is based on the conservation of energy. And this law says that the sum of the EMFs around a circuit loop, note that I'm talking about a circuit loop, not the whole circuit, is equal to the sum of the potential difference drops around the same loop. So we choose a loop and then we look at the EMFs, then we look at the potential differences. So here's a circuit, I've got a couple of EMFs there. Uh, a few resistors and light bulbs with various potential drops across them. This example has many circuit loops, so we'll be looking at each one in turn. And firstly, let's define a current direction. So I'm going to define a current direction around this way. And if we get any negative values, that will indicate that our current directions were incorrect. If we cross a cell from the negative to the positive terminals, which would be the normal direction, so going from there to there, then it's positive. But if we go like across E2, positive to negative, then as, as we go and work our way around the circuit loop, then take it away, it's negative. If we cross a potential difference in the same direction as the current, so if, if I say current is flowing this way and I go across here, I add it. Uh, but if I said the current was going, going this way and I went across it that way, then take it away. So let's have a look. I'm going to start here at this corner there. And this is my first circuit loop. And as I go around the circuit loop, the sum of the EMFs is E1. The sum of the potential difference drops is V1 plus V2 plus V3 plus V6. So that's left and right hand sides of the equation. Second loop is going around here. Okay, so that's how I'm performing my next loop. E1 is the only EMF again, and I've got V1, V4, V6. Next loop around there. So we've done three loops. Now I'm going across two EMFs. Now I'm going across, when I go 
across E2, it's positive to the negative term, so that's, I'm taking that one away, and E1 is added. And then I've got those potential drops. Now I'm going to look at these little bits here. These are also circuit loops that need to be analysed. I'm going to start at this junction for each of those. So the first one down here is to go around this. So I've got, I'm going in the same direction as my current direction here, so plus V4. But I'm going against the current for V3 and V2, so minus V3, minus V2. Then I've got this bit down here, so minus the E2, and that's equal to V5 minus V4. And then the last one is around here, so same thing. Anyway, then I've got all of these equations, and if I have numbers, then I can start solving problems with simultaneous equations and so on. So that's how you'd use Kirchhoff's second law. Those are Kirchhoff's laws. Series in parallel. What we'll do in each case for series and then for parallel is try to find the single resistor that we can replace our two resistors with. So I've got two resistors, R1 and R2. And I'm going to replace them with one resistor that has the same total value of resistance. And I'm going to call that R subscript S for series. Now, here we have the same current flowing through each resistor. Whatever current flows through here will flow through here. The current doesn't get used up. But the voltage is shared across them. There's, there's a voltage drop across them, and it's different in each case. The total voltage, Vs, is equal to V1 plus V2. So that voltage plus that voltage gives me the total voltage across the whole combination and therefore across RS. And uh, I can now substitute for using substitute for the V's using V equals IR. Vs is equal to the current times RS, and V1 is equal to IR1 and so on. Now notice I've got I's in each term there, so I can divide by I on the left and right hand sides of the equation, and I'll get that Rs is the sum of R1 and R2. So that's our series equation. And that tells me that the resistance will always increase if I put resistors in series. Parallel. Here's my parallel arrangement here. And I want to replace it with Rp, which is our parallel, the total resistance of parallel. The, the current splits at the junction, so the current through each one is different. But the voltage across them is the same. So shared current, same voltage. Now, IP, the total current through here is going to be the current through here, is equal to I1 plus I2. We know that from Kirchhoff's laws, so this current is splitting along those two. And then we've got the same voltage, so the voltage across here, I'm going to call VP, is the same voltage across there. And I'm going to use I equals V over R here, so the IP is equal to VP divided by this resistance RP, and VP over R1 will give me I1, and VP over R2 will give me... I2. So then what I'm left with is an equation with VP in every term, so I can divide again by VP each term. So the VPs cancel out and I'm left with 1 over RP is equal to 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2. And that equation tells me that the, volt, the resistance will always decrease. So whatever the size R1 is and R2 is, the resistance will always be less than the smallest one. When you're using this equation for parallel resistors, don't forget to take the reciprocal at the end. So, you know, if you had a 10 ohm and a 20 ohm resistor, 1 over RP is 1 over 10 plus 1 over 20. So it would be 3 over 20. And then a lot of people will just work out 3 over 20. What you need to do is take the reciprocal 
of 3 over 20, so it'd be 20 over 3, that'll be your final answer. So don't forget that, 1 over R. Ammeters and voltmeters then. How should you use ammeters and voltmeters? The current is the same in series. So I need to put my ammeter in series with the device that I want to read the current through. So I've got a lamp here, I want to read the current through that. I need to put it in series. But in order that the current is through the lamp is not changed, I want to have a, a, as low a resistance as possible. Ideally, I want zero resistance so that the same current is flowing through there. It's as if the ammeter is not there. Okay? So I don't want to impede the original current. But if I put the ammeter in parallel, then the lamp won't light up because all of the current will flow through the ammeter, basically. Because the ammeter has very low resistance. So you, you make your ammeter with very low resistance. And if you put it in parallel, it will essentially short out the lamp. So the lamp won't work because it has much lower resistance than that. So, th so that's why an ammeter has very low resistance and why you should put it in series and not in parallel. Voltmeters. Voltage is the same in parallel. So I want to put my voltmeter in parallel. There's my lamp. I'm going to put the voltmeter in parallel to that. Now, in order that the current through the lamp is not changed, in this case, what I want to do is have as high a resistance as possible. I want a, an infinite resistance here so that no current flows through here, or hardly any current flows through here. That means that if I put it in series, there's going to be so much resistance along the branch that the lamp is on that no current flows through it. So you shouldn't put it in series, apart from the fact that it won't actually read the voltage for your lamp anyway. Same with the putting the ammeter in power, it's not going to read the current through the lamp anymore. So that's how you should use ammeters and voltmeters. And now we're on to resistivity. <coughs> I'm going to take sections of a material, like this, just little cylinders of the material, and each piece of material has a resistance of R, a length L, and a cross-sectional area of A. And now I'm going to put two in series. So what happens when I have two in series? The total resistance of that combination, using the series relationship that we just looked at, is 2R, because it's R plus R. The total length is 2L, it's twice as long. The cross-sectional area is still A, because if I take a cut through any point along there, the cross-sectional area will be exactly the same as if I just took a cut through that one piece of the two that I was starting off with. So the area has not changed, but when I doubled the length, the resistance doubled. And that tells me that the resistance is directly proportional to the length. Okay, so that's a relationship that's useful. If I double the length of my conductor material, the resistance will double. What about if I put two pieces of material in parallel? Okay, so now we've got them in parallel. What changes this time? The resistance is half R, because if you use the, resi the resistance in parallel equation, 1 over R is equal to 1 over R, so 1 over R total is equal to 1 over R plus 1 over R, which is 2 over R, and then taking the reciprocal will be R divided by 2. So the, the resistance is halved. The length is the same, you know, the length of the, this arrangement is the same, so it's still L. And the cross-sectional area, I cut through any point now, I'm cutting through two pieces of material this time, so the area, the cross-sectional area, is 2A. So what I've done is doubled the area, but the length stayed the same, and the resistance halved, so resistance is inversely proportional to cross-sectional area. Well, that's all very well and good. So I've got my two relationships there. R is proportional to, directly proportional to L and inversely proportional to A. Let's combine those two into one relationship. R is proportional to L divided by A then. And from here we can define resistivity. 
It's the proportionality concept for that relationship. So um, this is the Greek letter rho. Rho resistivity is equal to R A divided by L. What does it represent? It represents the resistance of a very large section of material. A piece of material which has a length of one metre and a cross-sectional area of one metre squared, which is very large. Now, if you had um, a piece of metal, that value would be very low because they'd be conductors. Units for rho are ohm metres. And if I give you an approximate range or an approximate value for a, a metal's resistivity, it's about 2 times 10 to the minus 8 ohm metres. Alright, so that's resistivity. And the purpose of that is so that I can compare one material with another. Res the resistance, if I just take, say, well, compare the resistance of that with the resistance of that, well, that resistance depends upon the length and cross sectional area. So I'd have to make sure in every single case that I'd have exactly the same length, exactly the same cross-sectional area. But with rho, and en engineers or electrical engineers, when they're comparing materials, they're, they'll refer to tables of the resistivity values so that they can see which material suits their purposes. And so rho is independent of length, independent of cross-sectional area, so that enables you to do a comparison. How good is how good a conductor is copper compared to aluminium, for example. So that's resistivity. Potential dividers. What a potential divider is, is a circuit that has resistances in series. And what, what they will do is divide the potential difference across them. Here's a Central divider that just uses two resistors here, R1 and R2, two fixed resistors there. And the potential difference across R1 is the voltage output for the potential divider, so we call that VO. And when you have, when you switch R2 for something that will change its resistance due to some external change, such as a change in light intensity, a change in temperature, the VO will, ch will change as well, and that would be used to trigger some other circuit. Now, um, VO is equal to, so what we're going to do here is derive the potential divider equation. VO is equal to the current flowing around the circuit here multiplied by R1. So we're going to use V equals IR for that. Then we're going to use I is equal to V over R for the whole circuit. So for the whole circuit, the total potential difference is V in, and the total resistance, because they're in series, is R1 plus R2. So I is V over R, which is V in over R1 plus R2. We can combine those equations, and then we'll get VO is equal to V in R1 over R1 plus R2. So the equation is the input voltage multiplied by a ratio of R1 to the total resistance. And that's the potential divider equation, so you can use that to work out voltage output. In fact, you, can, you don't have to use it if... Uh, you don't have to use it only when a question says it's a potential divider. If you have two resistors in series, you can use that equation because that's what a potential divider is. So, uh, let me just go back there. Right? This actually gives you multiple methods for solving problems because you've got this equation, you've got V equals IR, you've got uh, Kirchhoff's laws, so and the resistance equation, so you, you can use multiple methods to solve the same problem. And you, what you need to do is get used to looking at a problem, ascertaining what information has been given to you, and 
the methods that are available to you. You can't always use every single method, but there are often a few ways to solve the same problem. So think about the information you've been given and the methods that are at your disposal. In your preparation for any exam, you should be concentrating on getting your methods right. It's not about getting the right numerical answer every single time. You need to know that your methods are sound. And when they're not sound, that's what you need to be improving. So I always tell students, write down your working. You need to look at a problem, write down the equation you're going to use. Now start rearranging it and combining your equations where necessary. Then put the numbers in and see if you got the answer right. But it's all about the methods. Right, yeah, the uses of potential dividers. What's the point of having potential dividers? Well, they're very useful circuits. <coughs> if we switch our second resistor for a thermistor, then we can use this circuit as a temperature sensor. The resistance of this is going to change according to the temperature, and therefore the potential difference across here will change, and the potential difference across here will change. So our V out here would be connected to a circuit which is operating the central heating. So if V out drops below a certain threshold value, then it might turn the central heating on. Or if it goes above a certain value, it will turn the central heating off. So that will keep your, the temperature in your house at a, at a nice range of temperatures. If you switch that thermistor for an LDR, then we have a light sensing circuit. So now we can use this to operate a street lamp, for example. And you sometimes you can actually see the little dome on top of the street lamp, and that's got the LDR in it. And that will cause the voltage to go between, our, between some threshold values again. Uh, if it drops below a certain value because it's too dark, then the light will come on. Or if the voltage output goes above a certain value because it's too light, then it will switch the circuit off and so on, turn the light off. So there isn't someone sat in some room somewhere in the council building who's waiting for it to get light enough up, oh, turn the lights on, and then it's, uh, sorry, get, getting light enough to turn the lights off and then turn them on when it's night time. It's all automatically controlled by this type of circuit. I have a couple of additional points to make that I didn't make yesterday about LDRs and thermistors, how they work. I'll be looking at both in the context of a potential provider circuit. So this is my LDR in a potential provider. The resistance of the LDR varies according to light intensity, as this graph shows. So this is the resistance. You can see the resistance is higher at low light intensities, and at high light intensities, the resistance is low. And it follows this curved path here, curved graph. Now let's have a think about how the operation of this LDR will affect the potential divider and the voltage output. As the intensity increases, the resistance of the LDR will decrease, and that will cause the total resistance to decrease, because this is constant. So if this is decreasing, the total decreases, because remember they're in series. That's going to cause the total current flowing through the circuit to increase because the voltage input stays the same. And now, if we've got an increased current through this resistor, that will increase V0, uh, VO, sorry. VO will increase according to V equals IR. And the voltage across the LDR, although that's not something we're interested in, term, too interested in, in terms of the, getting the output from the potential provider circuit, but that will decrease because the total voltage remains constant. So if this increases, that must decrease. This LDR is more sensitive at lower light intensity. So as the light intensity decreases, you can see the gradient of the graph there getting steeper. So that means you get larger changes in the resistance for the same change in light intensity. So it becomes more sensitive at low light intensities. That's the LDR. Now let's look at a thermistor. This is my potential provider circuit with a thermistor in it. The resistance of the thermistor vary, depends on the temperature. Uh, according to this graph here, so I've got temperature 
going along the x-axis and resistance down the y-axis. How does this resistance affect voltage output? If the temperature increases, that will cause the resistance of the thermistor to decrease. Total resistance will again decrease. That will cause the total current flow to increase and VO, the voltage output, will therefore increase also and the voltage across the thermistor will decrease. So you can see that the logical steps that are taken to explain how the voltage output changes. That's the key thing, but I've also additionally noted what happens across the thermistor. And the reverse would be true if the temperature were to decrease, the resistance across the thermistor would increase, total current would drop, that would mean V output would drop, and the voltage across the thermistor would increase. So both for the thermistor and the LDR, the reverse is true. And this thermistor is more sensitive at lower temperatures for the same reason as the LDR. For the same change in temperature here, we're getting a larger change in resistance. So the voltage output change would be larger at the lower temperatures. So that's uh, thermistors and potential, uh, sorry, pot thermistors and LDRs in potential dividers. A couple of additional points of information for the lecture. So those are potential dividers. Now, internal resistance. There's actually a lot going on inside power supplies and batteries and as a consequence they have resistance. So power supplies and batteries they have resistance. What we would do is consider the power supply actually as a sort of an EMF source and which is in series with a small resistor. So we call this internal resistance lowercase r. So we call those collectively the internal circuit. And that's why I put this dotted line around here to indicate that's within the power supply. Often internal resistance is negligible because it's very small. The potential difference drop across here is very small, so it's often not counted in calculations. So just read the questions carefully, and they'll often say, the internal resistance is negligible, but if they don't, then you may need to take that into account. Always look at the information you're given. So now, that's my internal circuit, and this is how it connect onto an external circuit. I've got two resistors in series in my external circuit there. Yeah, batteries and resistance. Yeah. Okay, the output voltage is V is equal to the EMF minus the potential difference drop across the internal resistance. Right. Now let's plot a graph that relates to this. This is a plot of the terminal PD, and that's what we call like the output voltage for the power supply, against the current that is flowing. Okay, so it's a straight line with a negative gradient. And uh, if we compare, this is the equation, so if we compare that to y equals mx plus c, I've written it as y equals c plus mx, so we can more easily see how the quantities relate. On the y-axis, I've plotted v, so that's y is the terminal PV. On the x-axis, I've plotted i, so i is x, and that tells me that the y-intercept is E and minus R is equal to the gradient. Now that minus is important, it shouldn't be neglected because I've got a negative gradient. If R was equal to the gradient, then that would mean I'd have a negative resistance, which doesn't make sense. So that, that negative is important. The negative of the negative gradient, which is the positive value, is the internal resistance. So the gradient is minus R and the intercept is E. This is the maximum current that can flow, and that happens when the terminal PD is zero. And 
at zero current, I get the EMF. So if I put a voltmeter, which you remember has a very, very high resistance, so I'll get virtually no current flowing, I should be able to read the EMF or get as good a value as possible. Uh, the maximum current at when PD is zero means that you've, you've essentially shorted the circuit out, you've got very, very low resistance. Okay, uh, let's do an example calculation to finish then. What I've essentially got here is a battery which is being charged by a larger power supply. So that's why they're pointing in opposite directions, those cells. Now this is not the only method that you can use to solve this problem. Uh, so you may come up with another way of doing it. But let's, let's have a go at this. We want to calculate the 500 ohm, the, sorry, the current flow through the 500 ohm resistor. The 500 ohm resistor is this one here. So I want to find the current through there. I'm going to start off by calculating the total resistance of this parallel combination here, which is 1 over 1 over 300 plus 1 over 500. That gives me 188 ohms. So that's the total resistance there. Next, I'm going to use Kirchhoff's second law to determine the total current that flows into that parallel combination. So I'll go around the circuit. The sum of the EMFs is equal to the sum of the PDs across the, the loop that I went around. Now, I'm treating this as a single resistor because I've just found the total resistance of that combination. So I, I'm effectively replacing that with 188 ohms. So I can do that. And I've got a single circuit loop. So the sum of the EMS is 20 minus 12 because remember that I'm going positive to negative here and negative to positive here, so that's, a, that's plus and that's minus. And then the, all, through each resistor the same current flows, which is I. Now I've got I going into 188 ohms there, I going into 0.8 ohms there and then into 1.2. So if I define the current flow this way, which would be the sensible thing to do because this is a larger power supply than that one, larger EMF. Total resistances, they're all in series, so they get added up. I'm going to rearrange for the current here. So current is equal to 8 divided by the sum of that, which is, oh, this, this is 20, 20 minus 12, that gives me the 8 there. The sum of those is 190. So 8 over 190 gives me 0 0.0421 amps. The potential difference across the parallel resistors then, what's the potential difference across here? That's going to be equal to the current times the resistance. Uh, again, treating it as a single resistor there. And the, vol the voltage would be the same whether it was that single 188 ohm resistor or both of these. So the current times the resistance gives me 7.91 volts. And then the current is V over R. So, so yeah, V over R. So the voltage across here is 7.91. So the voltage is across this resistor. 7.91 over 500 gives me 0 0.0158 amps which is 15.8 milliamps. So that's the current flow through that resistor. And that's my example calculation. And that is it for electricity. I'll be back again for waves next week. <laughs>